Hi everyone, I am Carolise and today we're going to be talking about documentation skills. This is the second installment in our business analyst soft skills series. The first one we did on presentation skills and this one will be on documentation skills. But before I continue, check out my new intro video. Check it out. It's pretty cool, huh? So today we're going to have a collaboration in this video. First, I want to introduce you to Mr. Peeps. That's Mr. Peeps right there. That's going to be my sidekick going forward in these videos. And today in particular, because I'm celebrating Game of Thrones, for those of you who watch Game of Thrones, you know that this is the last season. And so I have my House Stark banner going on over here and my House Targaryen going on over here. And Today, we're going to get some help from the Khaleesi. So I'm Carolise, and I'm going to be tag teaming with the Khaleesi. I'll let her introduce herself. Go on, girl. I am Daenerys Stormborn of House Targaryen, of the blood of old Valyria. I am the dragon's daughter. That's right. So we're going to be doing it together. All right, so let's get into the business analyst documentation. Now, as a business analyst, you will have to write documentation and you got to be able to do that very well. Whether you are doing agile or you're doing waterfall, you definitely need documentation. So let me start with the agile people first. Because you're agile, right? And the agile manifesto does say working software over documentation that does not mean that you don't have documentation so a lot of people who are working in very agile shops they just go into their software maybe jira or whatever they use for their user stories and they go bang out some user stories put some acceptance criteria send that over to the developers and they're done with their documentation that's great if you're only going to deal with technical people because now what you've built is spread out across different sprints and it's spread out across different user stories that may be in different releases. And so it's very difficult, well, not difficult, but it's not as easy to pull it all together to say, this is what you've done, right? And so if you are only gonna deal with IT developers, that process is fine. But as a business analyst, you're not just dealing with technical people. You're gonna deal with the customer service people. You're gonna deal with the rest of the stakeholders, which could be your technical writers, it could be your managers, it could be the support people. And so they're gonna to need to know, what did you guys build? What is it? And they can't keep coming to you for you to answer their questions because you won't be free to do anything else. So you have to have some kind of documentation that you can say, here, here it is, this is what we did. Because if you're expecting that you're going to go into your software that you manage your user stories in and group them together and say here this is what we did that's not going to work because one not everybody in your organization is going to have access to whatever software you're using so for example if you're using jira your companies are going to pay for customer support to have access to jira so they won't know what you built right so you're going to have to summarize you're going to have to create a document that would probably be in Word or something that you can easily share with your external um, people because you might have vendors, you might have partners that you need to explain what you've built or with other team members who are not as deep in the technical details as you would be as the business analyst. So I always encourage people who are working in strict agile shops that it's great, it's fast, you can you know get things done quickly, you don't have to have this big long document but at the end of it, you need a place, you need something that, that captures everything that was done. And so that would be 
the document. Now, if you're on the waterfall side, you're already in heavy documentation, right? You're already writing your requirements document, and that would list out everything that you're going to build. Now, the requirements document is great for both the technical team and you as a business analyst, but sometimes it's too much for your technical writers, for your customer service people, for your support people. Sometimes it's just, it's because you write it for development, right? You write it so that people can like, code off of it. It's not really tailored for these other teams. So even though you do have your business requirements document, I'm not suggesting that you go and redo it for each you know, type of audience, although that would be great, but I, I'm not expecting you to go rewrite everything. But at least to, to have a section in there that summarizes everything that you've done so they don't have to go through all the manual details, right? So you still need documentation that will be consumable for these different teams, even if you're working already in a waterfall environment. Ain't that right, Khaleesi? Very well. See, my girl got my back. All right, so let's move on to how this document should be like i said before i think the document should be in some kind of a word document or something that's very shareable so if you do like a smart sheet or you do something online it's fine but it just needs to be something where if you need to send it to somebody else you don't have to worry about them not having the software to see it and all that stuff then it comes to what you actually write in the document let's go back to agile so in the agile process you already have your user stories with their acceptance criteria. Whenever you're writing a, requ a requirements document or you're writing a document that will be sent to external teams and vendors, you wanna have, <clears throat> at the start of it, you wanna have your summary. This is your business problem. This is the problem that prompted you to have this developed. And you explain that in as simple way as possible. You don't need to get into too many details. You just need to name what the problem is. Just say what the problem is and what the deficiency is in your system right now and then you have your solution overview that's just going to be a paragraph or two as to what the whole thing is going to be this is how we've solved the problem we're going to implement a new feature that will allow the customer to you know connect and upload their pictures online and all this stuff whatever it is that the software is actually going to do whatever the functionality of the feature is that's what you put in your solution and you always explain a little bit more about the things that it does not do so we're going to allow you to upload pictures but it's only going to be in jpeg or png format or something like that so you kind of call out the nuances and the things that um people would need to know like the support team or your technical team. After you've written your solution summary, you can give a little bit more detail about the requirements, maybe like a, a few, uh, like a one page uh, list, ability to be able to do this, ability, 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 ability. So you've listed out all the things that you can now do with your new feature, and that would be sufficient to send off to another team. So, because you're already in Agile, you already have user stories and you're not trying to recreate your user stories. You're just trying to capture everything that is done for this feature in a document that should be not not very lengthy maybe two three pages that you can then say this is the documentation for this feature and you send that off to all the people that would care about it that's in agile right if you're in waterfall you have to write requirements like really detailed requirements so i always have in my requirements document so if if the requirement is to add the ability to upload your pictures to your profile, then I'm gonna name that requirements document that very thing. Adding pictures to profile or adding profile images to the system. I, like I name it exactly what the feature is doing so that when I'm scanning through a list of requirements, I can pick it up quickly because I know what it is because it's named properly. So always name your requirements properly. That's the first thing. And then after you have that overview page, <clears throat> then you get into I normally have a table of contents if it's going to be a very lengthy document i try to put them in in sections and you know how to use word to create your section titles and so on everybody knows how to do that i do that and i put it in my table of contents i also have a table of figures because sometimes i might need to draw diagrams i might need to put screenshots and mockups in there and i always tag those and add that to my table of figures 
Then I get into my other page, which I talk about my, I do my revision history. So the revision history would say what you changed as you went on and once you had the discussion with the various teams, things change and so you just add that in your revision history. Then you have your problem statement, which I talked about before for Agile, and you have your solution overview, which I talked about again for Agile, so it's the same thing. Then you get into your requirements. Now requirements are a little bit different under waterfall than it is that I explained before in Agile. In the Agile process, you already had user stories. All you were doing was summarizing everything to give to somebody. With the requirements document, you don't have user stories. This is it. This is the requirement. This is what they're going to have to use to go write code. So you have to make it easy for them. So what you have to do is, first of all, it needs to be easy to read right it cannot be verbose it cannot be like paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs once you're writing requirements and you find that you've gone into like a block of paragraph you've missed the mark you've obviously gone into too much detail or the requirement needs to be simplified it needs to be a line two or three sentences the most three is even too much two sentences each thing the system must be must allow the user to upload an image the system must check to make sure the image type is a PNG or a, or a JPEG. The system must alert the user if the upload, upload um, was not successful. This, so it, it's like boom, 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 boom. You don't need paragraph because they're scanning the document. They're not reading the whole thing because the developers, they don't really care about all the extra stuff that you put in there. They wanna know what do I do? What do you want me to do? And you need to get to that very quickly. So the first thing is, because the requirements document will be, you know, it'd be the source of reference and people are going to have to look to it and talk about it and discuss it. You want to put all the requirements, number them. I've seen people write requirements documents with bullet points. It's not good because in the meeting you're like, under this section and everybody, this one, no, no, that one, no, no, go up, no, no, go down. Just number it. Just number it. And then you can say number 15. And people can quickly refer to what they're talking about and you all get on the same page much faster. Okay? Isn't that right, Khaleesi? He says yes. Right, girl. Because what do we say about knowledge, Khaleesi? No, it wasn't Khaleesi. It was the Lannisters. What did... No, it wasn't the Lannisters. It was, um... Peter Baelish. Okay, Peter, come on in. So you need to number your, your requirements. The requirements should not be a conjunction. There shouldn't be many conjunctions in your requirements. So um, you can't join two requirements together in the same sentence. It needs to be individual because if you join them, if there's a problem with one, then it's hard to separate where the problem is. So for example, if you say, um, system must allow the user to rename their profile and to upload their image. That's, that's not right. It should be two separate requirements. The system must allow the user to rename their profile. Second one, the system must allow the user to upload the profile image. So you have to separate them because there could be lots of things hidden behind that. So for example, if it says rename your profile, but then the developer comes back and say, oh yeah, do we need to save um, the old one in case they want to revert back or not. And it, I mean, it could, it could spin off into all different kinds of things. So you don't want to join it and make it be, be convoluted. You want it to be individual. So if you have to make notes or you have to refer to something, you have to explain what was decided, it can easily be done, okay? So don't use conjunctions in your requirements unless, unless on the very, very fringe cases, where you're trying to show a condition where you say, if the profile image has changed and the name has changed, then tell the user that you're not allowed, you only have three times to change your image or name or something, something like that. So in those kind of condition, if then else kind of condition, maybe you could, you know, it, it might be appropriate, but it's not, you shouldn't put several requirements together. So you write through your requirements and you have them in numbered lists and you space them out. I always like to use double spacing so it's easy to focus on what you want to look at. If it's just like all in a block, 
it's just visually not very nice so i use double spacing for my requirements and i use sections so if this is going to be the user requirement i put user requirement if it's something the system needs to do as a reaction to what the user did i put the system requirements and then i have a i have a whole discussion on whether or not business analysts should be writing system requirements and i have that video and i'll put that up there or in the description so you can find it so user requirements if you have system requirements you write that you could have configuration requirements which is what the things that the admin will be doing so you write those admin config requirements because sometimes it might be different from system requirements because for example you might say this the admin user must be able to configure the number of countries that are allowed to upload their pictures or something like that i don't know but there might be things that you want to be front end but only seen by the admin and there might be some things that the system is doing regardless so it might be the system must check to make sure that if the user puts in the country it automatically finds the country code in their telephone number so there are things the system is just doing automatically and those are some of the things i would consider to be system requirements so your system the user requirements sometimes your configuration requirements sometimes your system requirements depending on what you're doing Sometimes you might have UI requirements. Now, I don't really like writing UI requirements because it's just too detailed and I don't want to dictate design, but there are times when you have to call it out. Like for example, if you need this to be in a table format, it must be in a table because you want it to be able to, to, um, to be exported or something like that. You don't want it to just be fields on the screen. You want, then you got to call that out. And you could put something like that in your UI requirements. And then you might have data requirements. So it might be something where it's just in the back end where you're saying these fields from this part of the system must populate these fields in this part of the system. And that might just be a mapping and you put that in your data requirements. So it depends on your project. It depends on how your organization works, but these are the kinds of things that you should be thinking about when you're doing your requirements document. At the end of all of that, at the end, you sometimes you have an appendix where you put your mockups, your UML diagrams, and all the different things that complement what you have in your requirements, and you label those, and that will go into your table of figures, of course. Now, there are some people who like to put it all at the end. I've done that, and I've also had complaints. I've had complaints from the development team that say we don't want to be looking at requirement six way up here on page two and then we have to scroll all the way down to the bottom to look at the the, the mock-up that matches that it's it's too much scrolling it's too much scrolling for us and it's like we, we can't associate quickly just put the mock-up right beside the actual requirement so i've had that complaint and so it depends i mean i personally like to put it all together at the bottom but if that's going to work for them, I'm trying to facilitate them. So if they, if they want to see it beside the requirements, fine. I just put it right there beside the requirements. And that way you look at requirement six, you have the markup for six. You look at requirement seven, you got the markup for seven. And so you can associate quickly. And I see the value in that. I really do. I see the value in that. So you do it however your team prefers to see it because you're writing it for them anyway. And then at the end of all of that, you might have a section where you have your estimates so they can go through and they can put their estimates of how much story points or how much time or man hours or whatever you use to estimate. And that will go in there. So that's basically your document. Now, whether you're agile or you're waterfall, there's a couple of things I want to call out right now. I have been in situations where people are being like obsessed with the documentation. Like they have been like so stuck i would call it stuck on being meticulous that each word is right and the way you've said it is correct and you have to make it so but you really want to focus on the functionality and you have to focus on what is understandable and not necessarily how the book says you're to do it because we have a lot of requirements books out there written by very smart people and I know they know what they're talking about, but sometimes in your organization, it doesn't work. 
And so you can't go by the book all the time. You can't follow the book because the book is not specific to your situation. You got to customize it. So I've, I've seen people who make elaborate requirements documents and it becomes immediately obsolete because the minute you've written it, like nobody even looks at it again. Once they've built the software, nobody's looking at it. So what's the point of spending all this time being so meticulous about the actual wording and making sure everything is so perfect? Like the user must be able to do so-and-so. If somebody writes, the user should be able to, it's like, oh, that's not a requirements document. Oh, ain't that right, Khaleesi? See? So it's like, oh my God, you're not a good BA because you wrote should. It, it has to say must. Like those things are like, come on, come on. You're trying to facilitate understanding. I've also seen people go crazy on the UML. The UML is a visual way to convey an idea. Instead of you explaining and talking and talking, you can look at a picture, a picture tells a thousand words. Now, if you're doing a UML diagram, let's say you're doing a, let's say you're doing an activity diagram, right? Is it necessary? Does it help the people you're talking to to understand more of what you're trying to develop? Because if it doesn't, you're not impressing anyone by just showing all the diagrams that you've learned, right? And that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't have to draw the activity diagram in the exact same shape as it said in the book, and I don't have to make sure the line is the same solid line versus any other one and the the break is the same same kind of break i don't really have to do that all i need to do is draw a diagram that people can understand that's my take on it because sometimes we get into these these little boxes and we go into the room and we are so professional because we are bas and we know our stuff and we go in there and we are showing them this perfectly diagram perfectly done diagram according to the book and the people in the room are looking at it like Okay, they don't care if you didn't use the right lines. They really don't. I mean, if you work in an organization that they are very, they are stickler for these things, and by all means do it. But if you work in an organization where people don't care, they just want to know what you want them to build, you do whatever makes it easiest for your environment. And that's my takeaway from this. I want you guys to get that, that you don't have to stick to the book. Every company is doing their own thing. Some people it's working well, some people it's like a mess. But you need to work on the things that make sense for you and for your company and for your team and for the people that you're going to be working with. Don't think you have to do it exactly the way the book is doing it. Right? I've seen people draw flow charts and it's like, oh my God, different shapes of all kinds. And it's correct. It is correct. But it's not simple. And people start disassociating with it because it's just too complicated. There is no need to complicate your life. Just hope that you got that. Anyway, let me get off my soapbox. So once you have your requirements document done or you have your summary document of what you have in your user stories, then you need to store it in a place where people can find it. So if everybody's, you know, storing things on your SharePoint, then that's where you go. Or if it's stored on Dropbox or whatever your, your company uses, you put it there so it can be easily referenced. And then when technical writers come to you or the customer service comes to you or support comes to you, you can just ship that document over to them or point them in the direction of where it is. They go find it, they read, they answer their own questions and you're free to move on with your day. Okay, so that's the tips I have for you for now on documentation. I hope you enjoy this collaborative effort between myself and Khaleesi. What do you got to say, Khaleesi? Dracaris. <laughs> that is Storm Boy! Oh, before I go, I forgot to show you guys that... I have this. So if you guys watch Game of Thrones, you know what this is. This is for the hand of the king. That's right. Let me put it on right here. Hey, yes. So I am the hand of the king. That's right. Let me put it on the other side so it doesn't like get in the way too much. Hold on. Okay. Ha! 
I don't even know, it's twisted and because my clothes is so colorful, you can hardly see it, but there it is. I am the hand of the king. Okay, although I don't know who the king is because from the last season, we know that the king's all died and now Lannister, what's her name? Cersei is sitting on the throne, so I don't know. But anyway, I am the hand of the king. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was useful for you. I hope that you got some tips from this. So thank you guys for watching. Check out the presentation skills video and I'll be coming up with the next installment after this video. So please subscribe. I don't have enough subscribers. As you can see, I don't have enough. So just click that subscribe button. Give me a support and check out my dragon before you go. Take care, see you. <laughs>